So as we get started this morning, we're continuing in our series of uh, the book of First Timothy, and the subtitle for this series has been a, The Blueprint of a Gospel-Centered Church, which the theme verse that we're coming back to every week is found here in First Timothy chapter 3, but verse 15. We're not going to get to this verse this week, but Paul, in writing to Timothy, he says, look, here's the purpose of why I've written this letter to you. He said, so that you would know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. And so we've just been on this journey looking at the opposition that existed within this church from false teachers from within and how Paul was really directing Timothy and those within the church to get back to their gospel-centered ways, to get focused on the gospel itself. And today we're going to be talking about gospel-centered leaders. And as I was thinking about this week and just praying about this message, it reminded me this uh, a journey for you that's going to pop up on the screen. For some of you, it's just kind of a walk down memory lane. And for others, you just the first time you've ever seen this before. So you're going to see some pictures scroll on the screen of our renovation from now four summers ago. Can you believe this? Summer of 2019. There were some pictures of some of your kids in there that I just thought like, wow, they have grown incredibly. But for those of you who aren't aware or don't know, you may have walked the back hallway of our kids' space. It did not used to look that way. It used to look like 14 individual classrooms that were all kind of nice and tight back there with one hallway that ran down the middle. And we, sensing a need of all the children that God had brought us here at Faith, said, we've got to make space for them. So we overhauled and rehabbed and renovated that space. And what is just an incredible testimony of what God has done and continues to do through Faith Baptist Church is that over 90% of that work was all done in-house. I mean, very little of that work occurred because professionals were called in to do it. I mean, most of it, almost all of it occurred because we had the right people here at the right time with the right skill to lead us through this project, which is a huge part of this that I reflected on as well. We had amazing volunteers, men and women alike, who came and just gave of their time, hours and hours and hours of their time for months to donate the, their time and their efforts for this project. But you know what else we had? We had incredible leaders, incredible leaders who pointed the way and gave direction and knew how to read blueprints and knew how to do plumbing and electricity and you name it. I mean, they just had incredible wherewithal and incredible expertise and professionalism in this field. And it was made the project go so well. It made us be able to accomplish this with a common goal in mind because of their help and their leadership. And I know I'm going to leave out a few folks, I'm sure, but I just wanted to mention by name some of these people that led the charge on this. Guys like Josh Quick and Jared Struckoff and Mike Mullen and Kent Myers and Don Smith and Gene Kramer and Eric Kirst. I mean, it's just an incredible testimony of all the people that God brought to us, even along the way. When we needed an electrician, God brought us an electrician. When we needed a plumber, God brought us a plumber. It was just an amazing story of God at work, and it all came down to incredible leadership within the body of Christ as well. Now, why do I share that story? And what does it have to do with 1 Timothy chapter 3? Well, as we're going to see here in a moment, we're going to look at this passage where Paul directs his attention to the leaders in the church in two specific offices, and he starts to talk about the qualification of these leaders. And certainly we know that character matters when it comes to the quality of a leader. And Paul's going to talk about that this morning. But the connection I want to make here today and the big idea of today's message is going to come back to this when we start and even when we end today's message is this. From 1 Timothy 3, we see the character, the character of gospel-centered leaders is essential to the function of a gospel-centered church. That the character of gospel-centered leaders is essential to the function of a gospel-centered church. Now, I'm sure that we all could sit in a circle and just share stories and examples and testimonies of this for ourselves, but I can tell you my story is that I've been shaped by some incredible gospel-centered leaders in my life. Thankful for that. Just so overwhelmed by the incredible people that God has placed in my life. People like Rick Hedger and Ryan Palmer and my grandpa who's here with us today. And Brad Bennett and Eugene Tyndall and Kenny Qualls. And the list goes on and on and on. People who just took intentional time to pull me aside, bring me under their wing and lead by example and give encouragement and leadership to a young guy who really in a lot of ways had no idea what he was doing. And I'm just thankful and I praise God and I celebrate that there were quality men of character in my life, shaping me into the person that I'm still becoming today. And I pray and I hope that the same thing is true for every single one of you here in this room. 
Because we're going to see from this passage, yes, it talks about leaders within the church, but this is a passage for all of us. We're going to connect the dots and see that in a moment. But before we do, let's read our passage this morning from 1 Timothy chapter 3. In honoring of God's word, I'm going to invite you, if you are able, to please stand with us as we read from God's word, beginning in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. It says this, This saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to be an overseer, he desires a noble work. An overseer, therefore, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, but gentle, not quarrelsome and not greedy. He must manage his own household competently and have his children under control with all dignity. If anyone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? He must not be a new convert, or he might become conceited and incur the same condemnation as the devil. Furthermore, he must have a good reputation among outsiders so that he does not fall into disgrace in the devil's trap. Deacons, likewise, should be worthy of respect, not hypocritical, not drinking a lot of wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. They must also be tested first. If they prove blameless, then they can serve as deacons. Wives, too, must be worthy of respect, not slanderers, self-controlled, faithful in everything. Deacons are to be husbands of one wife, managing their children and their households well, competently. For those who have served well as deacons acquire a good standing for themselves and great boldness in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray this morning. Father, we come to you and we ask that you would help us to understand your words. And Lord, as I pray each and every week, it's my desire to teach and to preach your words, not my own. And Lord, in the spirit of that, I pray that you would help us by the power of your spirit to discern what is your truth and certainly what is the action that you're calling us to take today. So Lord, as we've seen and we've heard already, Lord, the character of gospel-centered leaders is essential to the function of a gospel-centered church. So Lord, help us to see this for ourselves and know how this applies to our lives individually as well. And I pray these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. So as we get started looking at this passage, I want you to notice something that's important. And that is, there's two specific offices, scriptural offices mentioned here in this passage that center around the rest of God's word as well. The first is an office that has multiple titles, but all mean the same thing, and that is the, the office of pastor, elder, or overseer. So Paul uses the term overseer here and uses that interchangeably in Scripture to describe the same office, pastor, elder, or overseer. And then the other office along with that is deacons, and this is the two offices that God has organized his church to, be, to operate within, and then the leaders that govern the church and help the church be able to pursue gospel-centered ministry. Now, with that said, I want us to take a look at each of these because many of these characteristics that you've probably seen on our first read here, and as we go back through this and kind of comb through it verse by verse, they parallel. They're, they're very similar to each other with a couple of distinguishing marks, but I want us to be able to take these at face value and just really understand what Paul is saying and what he's describing. So let's begin. First of all, let's go back to verse 2. Let's look at the overseer where Paul begins in this passage. I want us to see this first and foremost, and that is that the overseer is obedient in teaching and in conduct. What's it say there in verse 2? It says, an overseer, therefore, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, self-controlled and sensible and respectable, hospitable and able to teach. Now, that's important. I want you to underline that or circle that or just make note of that in your Bible as well, because that is a distinguishing mark between the overseer and the deacon, the ability to teach as a requirement here in Scripture. And then in verse 3, it says, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not greedy. Remember, in the life of the church of Ephesus, there was some of this happening. There were quarrels, there were fights, there were arguments, there was bad behavior, let's just put it that way, by men and women alike. And so Paul is using this as the backdrop to say, look, certainly for the church's leaders, this should not be so. They are to be obedient, the overseers, obedient in teaching and in conduct. And so teaching, what does that mean? The ability to teach. It means that you're able to take God's word as it is, again, speaking his words of truth, not your own, and be able to help people know and understand how to apply it and live it out in their lives. That is what that 
means, and it is the standout between this office, this position, and deacons. But also notice as he continues this thought, he goes on, he says, not only that, but the overseer is also a godly leader to his family. Now, this is significant and important because Paul kind of touches on this as well here in these verses. He says, look, if you must manage his own household competently and have his children under control with all dignity, and why is that? He says in verse 5, because if anyone doesn't know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? Here's the bottom line of essentially what Paul's trying to say here. Look, leaders, these particular men, these overseers in the church, their leadership in the church is a reflection of the leadership at home and vice versa. Their leadership at home is going to be a reflection of their leadership in the church. And so he says this is of high value. Now, also, it's important of mentioning here is like, does this mean that this is a requirement for those who are in this office within the church? No, I don't think so. And why is that? Well, look elsewhere in Scripture. Jesus was single. Paul himself, who's writing this, was single. It's not a requirement, but it is saying that for those who are married, the management of their household is of utmost importance importance. And it goes on to even tie to what we looked at last week, that this position is reserved for men. It is why Paul said what he said in chapter two. He's connecting the dots. All of this flows together in context. When he said, look, I do not allow or I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over man in this particular role in office of overseer, elder, or pastor. So he just continues to develop this thought. But he goes on furthermore to say as well that the overseer is a mature believer. Listen to what he says in verse 6. He says, he must not be a new convert, or he might become conceited and incur the same condemnation as the devil. Now, why does this matter? Why does a leader's status, their spiritual status, and kind of where they're at in their spiritual journey, why does it matter? Because the enemy matters, and he is trying to steal, kill, and destroy every good thing that God is doing. And so we know, many of us have seen this from experience, that when we put people in places of leadership it, too far, too soon, it can have a hard, hard impact on their spiritual journey and on their own discipleship. So Paul is saying, look, let's get this right. Let's be gospel-centered. Let's disciple. Let's help other believers grow and mature. Let's make sure that we're dedicating ourselves to that. And we believe with all of our hearts, we dedicate ourselves to that. God will bring the leaders, and he will bring them into the positions according to his timing and his purpose and his will. He says, do not rush this, essentially, is what he's saying. But he also goes so far as to say the overseer is respected by unbelievers in verse 7. He says, furthermore, he must have a good reputation among outsiders so that he does not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. In other words, does the way that this man live his life within the church and around believers, brothers and sisters in Christ, does it match up and parallel the way that he lives his life and represents himself around non-believers? There's no room for hypocrisy here. There's no room for teaching and admonishing and encouraging one thing in one setting and then turning around and living and teaching and admonishing something else in another setting. So Paul says, let's get this right. Those who aspire to be in the office of elder, o, overseer or elder or pastor must not be hypocritical. They must have a good reputation and respected by unbelievers. Then he turns his attention to the deacon in verses 8 to 13. What does he have to say, again, very similar, but worth mentioning as well. He says in verse 8 and 9, they are obedient in conduct. He says, deacons, likewise, should be worthy of respect. Goes on and says the same, kind of tying to what he just ended with in the last verse. Not hypocritical, he says. Not drinking a lot of wine and not greedy for money and not holding, or excuse me, holding the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. I don't know if you've noticed this in Paul's writings, but it's certainly shown up here in 1 Timothy alone. He loves that phrase, clear conscience. Have you noticed that? It's, what he's describing is essentially the ability for a person, a believer, but in this case, he says those who aspire to be in the office of deacon, to, to be able to lay it out all on the line for the sake of the Lord, to be able to serve and to love others knowing that they're holding nothing back. That's what he's getting at. That's the heart of his message here, that they're obedient in their conduct, even to the point where it costs them even of themselves to serve the same way that Christ did. What does it say in Scripture about how Christ served? He did not come to be served, but to serve others, right? And to give his life as a ransom for many. So he says they're obedient in their conduct. But also notice, secondly, in verse 10, he says that they're proven through testing. 
It says in verse 10, they must also be tested first. And if they prove blameless, then they can serve as deacons. Now, I'm thankful that this is a part of our training process here at Faith with our deacons. There is a year-long, minimum year-long process where those who've been nominated as deacons and, and by our church family and go through this process have to just submit themselves to learning and growing in a time of testing to be able to truly exhibit not only what others see in them, but amongst this group of deacons as well. Before they're ever presented to the church as to be ordained, that occurs. And I'm thankful that that is a rhythm that's been created and certainly adhered to among our deacon ministry. It's important, proven through testing. But also notice what he says, beginning in verse 11, similar to what he said for the overseer, that this deacon is also a godly leader at home. It says in verse 11, wives too must be worthy of respect and not slanderers and self-controlled and faithful in everything. Deacons are to be husbands of one wife, managing their children and their own households competently. The same description that he gave for those who aspire to be overseers as well. The management of the home, the oversight of the home, the ministry in the home matters for those who desire to be in these leadership positions. But also notice where he ends here in verse 13. And I love this verse, just the summary of this, I think it strikes at the heart of what a deacon is and supposed to be. He says that deacons will be commended for their servanthood. It says in verse 13, those who've served well as deacons acquire a good standing for themselves and great boldness in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. You know, I just, I have to take a moment and I just have to celebrate and give God thanks and praise and all the glory for the wonderful deacons and their wives that we have here at Faith Baptist Church. They are tremendous. And many of you have benefited from their ministry, just from the cards that they write on birthdays or special events in your life or the fact that they enter into those times of, of hardship, whether you're grieving a loss or whether you're going through physical pain or a health trouble or whatever it may be. I mean, they are there. They are pressing in. They are leaning into those situations and serving the body of Christ in a God-honoring way that I am just thankful for. They certainly will be commended for their servanthood. This verse here, for those who've served well, deacons, hear my heart on this, and your wives, you have served well. Thank you. Continue to do the great work that you're doing, and I praise God for all that he is doing in and through you. So what in the world do these qualifications have to do with us, right, as the body of Christ. It seems like at first that this is a pretty uh, specific passage, which it is. It certainly is. There's, I don't want to deny that or take away from that, but I do truly believe there are some takeaways from this that apply to the greater audience of the church at large, and I want to see just two of those this morning. I want you to see just two of those this morning. Here's the first one. Number one, from this passage, what we see is that character, character, not competency, is what qualifies a gospel-centered leader. Character, not competency, is what qualifies a gospel-centered leader. Now, what do I mean by that? Look at every single one of these qualifications that's laid out before us. With the exception of the ability to teach, every single one of them is a matter of what? Character. Gospel-centered character. Does competency matter? Does it, is it valuable in the eyes of God? Absolutely it is. But should it be placed above character? I don't believe so. I don't believe God's word teaches us that. I don't believe God's word is certainly showing us that in these 13 verses that we've just read and seen ourselves. I have an example of this that's near and dear to my heart, and I'm sure for many of you, you've seen and experienced this for, this for yourselves. How many times have you come to the place where sometimes it might even be someone that you know personally or maybe just somebody you've heard of in the world of celebrity pastors and celebrity leaders within the church where your heart just breaks and aches because you find out that there's just been another falling out of one prominent leader, right? And your heart just hurts and it aches. And again, I, I've seen this happen and I've experienced this with people that I don't know personally and people that I do know personally. In some cases, I'm not saying in every case, there's certainly 
no perfect way to go about this. But in some cases, I believe that there is a prominent issue of this for quite some time because we're just human beings. And sometimes we tend to place competency above character. We tend to say, is the person gifted? And the process that goes through like enlisting leaders, it's all about like, can you do this? And can you do that? And do you have this gift? And do you have that ability? And, and I just have to say, we've got it backwards. What does God's word tell us? God's word tells us that we see the outside. The Lord sees the heart. And it might take more time, and it might take more effort, and it might take a little bit more involvement on our part to really zero in and lock in on the character that truly flows from a spirit-filled person to really discern whether or not that's there or being shaped or being developed in a person. But I tell you, it's worth it all to make sure that character is valued more than competency. That's vitally important for us to remember as we think about where the Lord is leading us and taking us as a church. But also, I want you to notice this. Second of all, what God requires for gospel-centered leaders, He desires for every gospel-centered believer. What God requires for gospel-centered leaders, He desires for for every gospel-centered believer. There are loads and loads and loads of examples of this in Scripture that we could turn to and look to to just see when Paul or any author, for that matter, is writing to the church how there is a clear emphasis on the character of us as individual believers, as followers of Jesus. But one of the things that I celebrate and I'm encouraged by we as a church this past summer engaged in a series of conversations that we're about to wrap up, um, these elder discussions, as we started looking at the Word of God and we said, okay, let's take the Word and let's compare what God says in the Word as far as how we should structure ourselves and how we should be led as far as leadership is concerned, and let's compare that to where God has us currently, and let's ask ourselves, are we following God's Word? Are we submitting ourselves to His design, right, to his leadership over us and the household that he's called us to be a part of. Through that process, in the very first discussion that we ever had, we were right here in this passage. We were right here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, looking over all these qualifications of the overseer. And I remember in our time of question and answer at the very end, it was Joy Schultz who just raised her hand and so quietly and gently just sort of in a question, but more in a statement said, well, it's interesting to me because Shouldn't we all be living according to these characteristics? And I said, yes. Amen. You got it, Joyce. That's exactly right. These characteristics that God desires, he requires for these leaders, he desires for every single one of us to be Christ-like, to be gospel-centered, not only in our thinking, but in our living, in our conduct, in our, in our obedience, in all of these aspects. And again, there are so many places we could turn to in Scripture to find evidence for this, but I want to give you just one example this morning from Colossians chapter 1. Now, I'm not going to read the full passage in its context, but just to set this up, remember in Colossians chapter 1, Paul is trying to set the stage of the centrality of Jesus Christ, right, as the creator of the heavens and the earth. He says, for by him and through him and in him all things were created, things under heaven and earth, and you name it. Like, it's just this beautiful passage. And then right after that, in verses 21 and 22, these are the words that Paul writes to the church of Colossae. Listen to what he says. And he says, you, you believers, right, you who were once alienated, you were hostile in your mind. You were doing evil things. You were doing evil deeds. He, God himself, has now reconciled you in his body of his flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless. And then listen to this wording. Where, does, where did we just hear this? He says to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Doesn't that sound exactly like what we just read here? above reproach. And so church, where does this hit home for all of us? What God requires for gospel-centered leaders, he desires for every gospel-centered believer. These are things that he wants us to value, to pursue, and to evaluate in our life, and just to take time daily to say, do these characters, do these qualities truly matter to me? 
But I also want you to notice this. I want you to be encouraged by this as well. I hope you're not discouraged because if, sometimes we do take those evaluations and that's the territory where the enemy just loves to just beat us up. He loves to remind us like, you're terrible. You're an awful person. You're not, you're not even a Christian. How could you call yourself a Christian? Because you lied today or you got angry in traffic or whatever. Like that's what the enemy does. He likes to steal and kill and destroy. And he likes to sow seeds of deception. So here's the encouragement I have for you. None of these characteristics we just talked about can be produced by you. All of them are produced by a work of the Holy Spirit in your life. I want you to be encouraged by that. I don't want you to miss the importance of that. These are not something that you just wake up one morning and just decide, like, guess what? Today I'm going to have more patience. Now, you can try that approach, but I'll just tell you by raising my hand, I've tried and I've failed many times. It just doesn't work. What you can do is you can get on your knees before the Lord every single day and you can say, Lord, I confess to you that I'm impatient. I have a tendency to just draw my own conclusions and to do my own things and to seek control and whatever it is. I'm speaking like these are my own words. These are things I struggle with. And you can get before the Lord honestly and you can confess that to him and you can declare that to him and you can just say, Lord, I need your spirit to work this out of me. And I need you to fill me with your spirit so that I can exhibit more patience towards my kids today, more patience towards my wife, more patience in traffic, whatever it is. I need you to do this in my life. When you come to that place where you realize your dependence upon the spirit of God in your life, you're in a great place. But you cannot do this on your own. You cannot muster this up by yourself. So with that in mind, a question that I want to ask every single one of you this morning is simply this. Do you have the assurance of salvation in your life? Do you have the assurance that you are in Christ today, that you are following Jesus right here, right now? Can you say that without any shadow of a doubt? Because here's what we know. Scripture teaches us, reminds us frequently in, throughout all of, its, all of its narrative, throughout the whole story of Scripture, we're reminded that we cannot save ourselves. It is a work that Jesus Christ has done for us. And in that moment when you receive the free gift of salvation, when you come to the place where you admit that you're a sinner and you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you believe that he died on the cross for your sins and you believe that he rose from the grave and you confess that, that he is Lord and that he make it public like you just saw this morning from these young men and you profess your faith publicly, guess what? The Holy Spirit's involved in all of that. But here's the greatest news. The Holy Spirit is with you always after that, always shaping you, molding you, sanctifying you, changing you, transforming you from the inside out. And so any of these things in your life that you just say, like, I struggle with this. I have an alcohol issue. Lord, take care of it. You can't do it by yourself. You need the Holy Spirit's guidance in your life. And so I would just ask you, step one is just getting on your knees and confessing your need for a Savior. That's step one. But for some of us, we would say, look, I've done that. I've come to the place where I've acknowledged my need for a Savior, and I've called out to Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior. Praise God. I, I'm thankful for that. So here's my encouragement and my challenge to all of you. My encouragement and challenge is this. I'm going to call you specifically to pray. Pray that God would continually develop within us the body of Christ here at faith and certainly within our, our current and our future leaders, that he would develop within us this heart and this passion to be men and women of character, to desire what God desires above all else. And when we come to those places in our life where maybe it's just one small pocket, maybe it's just one little thing that we need to confess to the Lord, that we would do it anyway, that we would not minimize our sin, that we would not minimize what the enemy can do with that, and how he can shape that small little seed that the enemy likes to plant in our minds and in our thoughts at times and make it into something that was never intended to be. I pray that we would get serious about calling out to God and saying, we need your spirit's work to go to work in us so that he can do a great work through us. The other encouragement I would give you is simply this. We've been having conversations over the course of the summer, and we continue to pursue a gospel-centered leadership structure here at Faith. 
to get on our knees before the Lord and say, God, we just want to be obedient to you, to your word. And this might mean that we need to make some changes. This, not, this might mean that we need to reorganize ourselves around your word, around a gospel-centered structure of leadership that brings glory and honor to you. And I would ask you, please just pray for us. Please pray for us as we lean into that more. And pray for your, you as the body of Christ here at Faith as well. But this will be something that we do willingly, cheerfully, joyfully, as we continually just get ourselves before the Lord and ask, what do we need to change in order to be perfectly in line with your will and your desire for us as a church? With those encouragements and challenges in mind, I want to give you the opportunity right here and right now to respond however the Lord would lead you. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. Nathan's going to come forward and we're going to close here in just a second with the singing of a song that we know very well, Great is Thy Faithfulness. But before we get there, I just want to ask you to pause for a moment and just to reflect and to ask yourself, do these characteristics, these qualifications, do they describe me? Do they describe the people that are in my life? Do I need to pray more earnestly that God would work these certain struggles out of my life, not because I can do it, but because I believe wholeheartedly that his spirit can do it. Maybe that's where you need to spend your prayer effort and your prayer time this morning. But also, I mentioned a moment ago, for some of you, you may be wrestling with whether or not you're even in Christ, with whether or not you have this gift that comes, this gift of the spirit that is given to all who profess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So I don't know where you are in that spectrum. I don't know if you're in Christ, not in Christ, or God is drawing you to himself. But I just want to give you a few moments here and now just to declare your heart, confess your heart to the Lord and share with him, God, this is where I'm at. This is what I desire. This is where I want to be. I want to be in the center of your will. And I'm just calling out to you right here, right now, that you would do a great work in me. So I'm going to give you a moment, and I'm going to pray for us. And then as we sing this song this morning, I'm going to encourage you, if you responded in some way, shape, or form today, to come find me or come find Ken. We would love to pray with you. We'd love to take a moment and just celebrate how God's working in your life. And if you're not comfortable with doing that, then just fill out today's Connect card and just write briefly how the Lord stirred you today so we can follow up with you. We want to be able to come alongside you, encourage you, strengthen you in your walk in Christ. Not because we're perfect and we have it all figured out, but because we do follow a perfectly holy God. We want to lead you to him. Let's pray together. Father, however you would lead us today to respond to you, I pray that we would just simply be obedient. Lord, thank you for this reminder today, this emphasis on the character of gospel-centered leaders And Lord, how what you require for these leaders is something you desire for every single one of us. And Lord, these characters, they are essential to the function of this church. So Lord, I pray that we would be a people individually that value character above all else, godly character. And that out of that character, Lord, you would shape us, you would gift us, you would mold us to be competent in the areas that you call us to serve. And but Lord, all of that would be an overflow of a heart that beats for you, that is truly in love with Jesus. So God, as you've stirred hearts this morning, I pray that you would boldly lead us to respond as you direct. That we would not look around the room or be hindered by anything that's happening around us, but simply follow you and that you would receive the glory. I pray these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing. You respond as the Lord leads you.